Ennis will return next Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock, 7 Central and Mountain Time on most of these stations. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Coming to Kickstarter from the mind of Franco, the man behind Teen Titans Go to the Library, Faye of the Moon, and All Yeah Comics, comes the new LXT, the adversarial fighting card game, live now on Kickstarter. LXT, Lux vs. Tenebris. Imagine a loved one has been spirited away to a land of terror and torture. Would you be willing to go after them and fight through a horde of acolytes of the Dark One just to get them back? Developed as a role-playing card game that can be played multiple ways. The cards will have full-color illustrations on the front and chock-full of stamps and moves on the back. You can also get the LXT Who's Who book with origin stories and information about all the characters. Still want more? Also available is the LXT Dark Atlas book, filled with pro stories about all the baddies and illustrations from a wide selection of comic artists. There are plenty of add-ons you can purchase separately like comic books, stickers, original art from the game, and more. It's going to be a howling good time. LXT, live, now on Kickstarter. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Happy to welcome Mark Russell back to Word Balloon. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, geez, uh, it, uh, it you know, I don't know. Is DC uh, back on Wednesdays, or is are they still Tuesday first? They're back on Wednesdays. They Fantastic. So back, today. Calling back to Wednesday. That's good. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad they're back to Wednesday. They should be on. Now, this is an alternate cover. But I am digging uh, Batman Dark Age. You and the All Reds. Uh, what a great story. Uh, kind of following up on Superman Space Age. But as you were telling me off the air, this is, uh, I mean, they're all different takes, but this is a different universe than the uh, Space Age Superman story. Yeah, same basic premise. And that it ties into Crisis on Infinite Earths, where the universe is doomed, but a different universe than the one we saw in Superman Space Age. So everything's a little different. Uh, and that, by the way, is one of my favorite covers I've ever had for any comic I've ever done. Uh, I've got poster. I've got a poster of that like hanging on my wall. That's outstanding. I don't blame you, man. I, I as I was telling you off the air, I just talked to Mike uh, a, about a month or so ago, and it was just fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It's the first time I ever had a chance to really sit down and have a conversation with him. And really, I love what you guys are doing together. I. I don't know if beyond uh, Batman uh, Dark Age, if you have other DC heroes that the two of you want to tackle, or and maybe DC will give you the green light on those. Yeah, we're planning actually for a trilogy uh, with the third one centering around Wonder Woman. Uh, it has yet to be officially greenlit, so I can't guarantee that, but that's the plan. That'd be great. And and it's uh, what I love about this story is it really goes from uh, the early, or I should say the late 50s, to all the way through uh, to 2030, where we see uh, Old Man Bruce kind of uh, sadly, I think, maybe dealing with um, Alzheimer's or, memory, you know, just age, mem memory loss. Yeah, dementia. And I think this is a big difference between this uh, issue and uh, or this series and Superman Space Age, that Superman Space Age is narrated by Superman in his journal as life is going forward. So he's writing it down as he's experiencing it. So it's full of hope and sort of thoughts about the future. Whereas uh, Batman Dark Age is narrated by Bruce Wayne in the in the future, where he knows everything that's happening, knows everything that goes wrong. And so it's very much about a, a man speaking from a position of regret or looking back as it's going. So the narration, I think, gives it a very different tonality. Absolutely. And uh, man, I love the shades of all the different characters. I, uh, did I put it? Yeah, here we go. You know, it's, uh, again, 
uh, stemming from uh, the death of the Waynes, uh, this Bruce is a little more restless, young Bruce and everything. And we see him kind of get in trouble a few times. Here's a shot of him and Alfred. And, uh, you know, again, you know, it's I love this line here. You know, your father didn't see wealth as a privilege, but as an obligation. And, yeah, that's what made him who he is today. In other words, yeah, and he's dead for it, Alfred. Uh, which, yeah. you know, you could appreciate Bruce's point of view in this universe. Yeah, one of my uh, sort of objections to the way the Bruce Wayne to Batman origin story has been handled in the past is that it doesn't really give him a chance to deal or grapple with the, the grief or the loss of his parents. It's like he, he sees his parents assassinated, and then, the you know, after a brief training montage, he's Batman. And, and this is very much more about the journey of like being a young man, being an adolescent who just expects to be killed any day himself because he just watched both his parents being gunned down. And as the heir to their fortune, he expects the same to happen to him about what that would do to you psychologically. So he really has to, I mean, going, becoming Batman really is like a longer journey for Bruce Wayne in this series than it is traditionally in, in other treatments of Batman that I've seen. That's great, man. And, and much like, um, your uh, life stories uh, that you did over at Marvel. I just like these slightly different shades of the established characters and stuff. And again, and forgive me if I'm conflating you with, I know Zdarsky did, I want to say Spider-Man life story. Yeah, Zdarsky did Spider-Man and I did, I did Fantastic Four. Yeah, yeah. No, this yeah, is that's great. the way I like to approach characters is like, I just take them seriously. I just think about like what it would be like to actually be that character and have these events happen to you. And write it from like what, how I feel, imagine I would respond, or how, you know, an, a normal human being, uh, like a fragile human being, somebody who wasn't a hero yet, would respond to the tragedies in their life, and about how heroism is really the process of survival, of surviving the things that would have destroyed you if you let them. You know, I I, uh, I respect in the modern DC universe that Alfred has been, you know, kind of, you know, they killed off Alfred and everything. But he is so important to Bruce and especially young Bruce. How do you how do you see Alfred in this series without spoiling, obviously? I think Alfred for for Bruce is sort of the one flickering light. You know, becomes very nihilistic because he sees both of his parents murdered. He uh, knows that the Wayne Wayne Enterprise is behind it, and he doesn't see any any uh, thing in the world other than people just acting on their own best interests. He doesn't really see any motivation present in the world except for greed, except for in Alfred. Alfred's the one guy who just sort of does things because that's who he is, because he's a decent human being and doesn't want to just sit by while this 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 child is murdered on his watch. And so Alfred, in a lot of ways, becomes sort of his guiding light. Like, this is, you don't have to just be somebody who operates um, under the uh, influence of greed and the uh, the incentives that that most people follow you can choose to a, a nobler path you know i also again i love this period that you've set the story into uh that late 50s early 60s period i i, I know you're a big comedy nerd and a, a pop culture fan and uh again i people can see it in the story and i'll, I'll talk about a couple of the depictions in a in a second but yeah as you say uh because thomas is gone uh, the, even though Bruce is in name in charge of the company, he's still a minor where the story starts. And, uh, you know, there are powers that be that aren't obviously looking out for his best interest or uh, Thomas's wishes. You know, I didn't I, I almost purposely did not put up uh, or didn't plan on putting up some shots of Allred's uh, depiction of the Gotham, the world of tomorrow that Thomas Wayne was kind of hoping for, because really I want people to buy the comic and see. And I love I love what the Allreds did with it. it. It just it looks amazing, and it has that Walt Disney uh, vibe in terms of a world of tomorrow. And certainly uh, on the Marvel side, you could argue how Howard Stark's you know plans in the MCU and what he wanted to do, which obviously were inspired by Walt and what uh, you know the kind of stuff that he was releasing in the late fifties through the sixties and stuff with Tomorrowland and the like. But yeah, I, I love I love these these ideas of an idealized Gotham that never came to pass. Yeah, I'm always very sort of fascinated by these sort of visions of the future from the past, like Epcot Center or like these show capitals. And I think that this is what you know Thomas Wayne had envisioned for Gotham. He envisioned a city where 
everybody could live as a king, basically, because the city's so livable and so easy to travel around, and where there's really not much difference between the life of the richest person in Gotham and the poorest person in Gotham. Of course, there's no money really to be had in that. There's no money really to be had in selling things to people who can't afford them, which is what Wayne Enterprises realizes. Uh, so, but that's really the the the. Uh, the, the, the beginning of the story. That's what sets Gotham down its dark path and sets uh, sets Bruce Wayne on, on the path to becoming Batman. There's this contest over his father's vision for Gotham. And I love the juxtaposition of these images of the world of tomorrow with uh, Batman dealing with uh, a false face gang. And I, and I love, you know, I can't think of the last time I saw false face, if ever, in a Batman comic. I don't know if the Batman 66 comic ever had any false face stories were you able to find any old false face stories uh if, you know researching for this i didn't really look for false face stories what i was really trying to do was populate this world one with with uh, some villains that we hadn't seen a lot of and you know make it a little fresh but also the ones that i just thought were visually iconic like this is this would scare the hell out of me if i saw these guys just walking on the street and the false face society is perfect for that that and it and it and it makes sense within the uh the um the idea that, that that gotham is controlled by this crime family that works with impunity so you could just have these masked you could just put a mask on anyone and then everyone knows that's someone who's working for the falcone family and they're untouchable the police have an excuse not to arrest you because they oh i don't know who he was he was wearing a mask and everybody, it's like you're wearing a mask that allows you to operate in broad daylight with impunity. And that's sort of what teaches Bruce Wayne that he needs to become Batman, that that this is the way you show the world that you're not afraid. That's great, man. No, and I, uh, again, the, the law is certainly uh, much like a lot of uh, uh, Batman stories. You know, you can't you can't rely on the police because you don't know who's really running things and who's getting paid off. And I think. It's it's great that you bring that into this story, and also in this era, uh, God, you know, of course, uh, some uh, familiar faces. We see Selena, uh, uh, and that's Bruce beaten up because, uh, you know, again, he's he's not uh, really, you know, uh, holding tr to the letter of the law. He's out there causing problems and getting arrested, but because of his influence, kind of getting away scot free. And I just I love beat Nick Selena. This is this is outstanding. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you know, I, I, I wanted to have their first meeting be as teenagers, and I wanted to show the very different trajectories of their lives where Bruce is this creature of privilege who has everything. And even though he's the one who's actually out, like, causing trouble, and, and, like, he gets arrested and nothing happens to him, whereas Selena is arrested just trying to survive, and she faces extremely severe consequences. So it's kind of showing the opposite trajectories of their lives in a, in a, in a picture of uh, their very different sort of beginnings. You're almost legitimizing, and I don't mean that, forgive me, everybody, because I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm sure there are people that love Batman that love the Gotham TV show, but this is almost a mere reverse image of the Gotham TV show in terms of Bruce trying to be good and Selena being a bad girl, as you know, in, in those teen depictions of the two of them and stuff. But yeah, and again, you know, Mike's Mike and Laura, they're 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 awesome, man. Again, I just I adore how how Selena looks in these things. Great, great look for her. Oh, it's fantastic, and and yeah, I, I couldn't think of a better look for Selena Kyle in like the late 1950s. And I I just want to take a moment to talk about Laura's coloring on these because it the pages are amazing when I see them in black and white. When Mike draws them, they look really iconic. But when Laura colors them, they look to me like like so almost like stained glass painting, stained glass you'd see in a church. Yeah, or like a cathedral they, they just really come to life I, th I think they they don't really come to life and seem like living people until laura colors them and she does such a great job with the colors have you, you know have you ever tried and it's a shame i only spoke to mike but really in the case of this book uh the colors are really i don't i don't know if they're um the prime you know the the primary colors that we used to get in the four color era uh, I, there's there's a bit more zip there, but yeah, have you ever have you discussed with Laura at all uh, how yeah, she's yeah. handling the color? Well, I mean, she's been privy to our conversations, and and yeah, uh, I think that the idea is to like sort of handle it almost like the Wizard of Oz, 
where like Gotham is very sort of stark and black and white and, you know, very sort of subdued earth tones uh, through the fifties until like the late sixties. And then in the late sixties, everything sort of opens up and it's like technicolor to sort of mirror the, what happened in America itself with the, you know, the counterculture. It's like everything was sort of, you know, brick colored and brown and sort of drab. Everything looked like either like, like a brownstone or like a, uh, like a, a, a ton, like a like a tree, until like the counterculture came around in the late '60s. And then all of a sudden, there's all these sort of you know fluorescent colors and you know rainbow sort of hues. And and I think that's when we introduced like the 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 what we think of as the uh, the, the the Batman Rogues Gallery, like the Riddler and the Penguin and the Joker. All of these are sort of this counterculture. These these this rainbow vision of villainy which sort of replaces the uh, the black and white, more sort of conservative, you know, Falcones and, you know, uh, Roman Sionis and these these sort of old school mafioso type villains in the same way that America went through like this explosion of counterculture and new ideas and vibrant colors. And uh, the Batman universe does too with the, uh, with the, the arrival, the uh, emergence of these, the, these new sort of Bowie-esque villains. That's excellent. Now I got to ask you then, because I was holding back on this image, but um, in in the first chapter, because what you're describing obviously is going to come in subsequent issues, I would imagine, because we really are still right. stuck in that. See more of that in issues two and three. Are there only three issues? How many issues, Mark? There's six. Six. Wow, that's great, man. And again, this is black label, so I know. Uh, first issues like you know forty some pages, forty five pages. It's 40, yeah, we're doing six issues of forty pages each, so total of two hundred forty pages. So when it's done, it will be exactly the same length as uh, as Superman Space Age. It's just that this one we're doing in six installments instead of three. Okay, that's great, man. No, I'm very excited. And uh, all right, so I got to ask, obviously, and again, everybody, you'll forgive the partial spoilers because the book did drop today. But uh, in this uh, late fifties, early sixties period. And, and probably searching for Selena, uh, Bruce ends up uh, at a at a coffee uh, house, and uh, you know ends up buying it because he can. Because first of all, he's underage, and it's like kind of that Howard Hughes move of, well, you can't stay here anymore. Really? Well, now I just bought the place, so tell me again <laughs> how I can't stay here. But there's a comedian, and again, I love Mike's uh, visual cues here. But you got to, I mean, all right, we got to stand up. And certainly that looks like Lenny Bruce. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, it, but can we make that Batman leap of a of a stand up comic and likely, you know, who that is? I, legally, I'm probably not supposed to say anything, but I think, you know, it's been long enough. I think yeah, I can go ahead and say, yeah, it's Lenny Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's all, all right. But is uh, OK. So it's not uh, I mean, I'm assuming from a story standpoint that we might be seeing an early iteration of this universe's version of the Joker. Not he's well, Lenny Bruce is not the Joker. I'll go ahead and say that. But, but the idea that, that Bruce Wayne buys this coffee house, which is where, you know, Lenny Bruce and a lot of early sort of, especially the edgier, like yes. mainstream comedians where they perform, they performed at coffee houses because they didn't have to worry about losing their liquor license. If, you know, a, a comedian was busted for obscenity as Lenny Bruce frequently was. So a lot of the best comedy was happening at coffee houses back then in like Greenwich village and places around New York. And, and so um, he buys this coffee shop and it becomes this sort of really um, important comedy club. And yeah, eventually one of the comedians who comes through the, the comedy club, which is called the Belfry, uh, is the Joker. So yeah, it is kind of setting this up that like okay. the Joker ends up like being like sort of like open mic stand up at Bruce Wayne's comedy club, the Belfry. Okay, so that all right. I assumed spoiler, almost... I, you know, a big spoiler. Yeah, bit, sorry, but I think I you'll mean, enjoy it anyway. I don't think anyone was reading just to find that out. Well, I agree, and also, and uh, wow, so that uh, essentially again, I don't want you to get in any legal trouble, but that's this isn't the Joker then. No, that's not the Joker. That's, awesome. that's not Bruce. But the Joker does come come up through this club. Sure, sure. And again, I kind of uh, that's great. That's even better. That again, Bruce has this encounter with a comedian. Let's call him a comedian generically. But it is of that, as you well know, uh, what they call the sick comedian era of guys like Lenny Bruce and um, okay. Now I'm suddenly blanking 
um, the the San Francisco comic that uh, that came from that era as well. We always had the newspaper under his. Uh, oh, under, uh, uh, Mort, Mort Saul. Mort Saul. Yeah, Mort Saul. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Yeah, like yeah, totally that that era. And I think in a lot of ways, it's about how the counterculture really began in the fifties. It just didn't become popular until the sixties. It didn't be, totally. become like fashionable for kids until the sixties. But all, you know, the Beats and the yeah. uh, the uh, Lenny Bruce's, the the sort of countercultural comedians, they that all began in the fifties. Uh, James Bunt wants to know when we're going to see uh, Batman go to Billionaire Island. <laughs> Uh, that I I think that's a that's a million dollar idea. Um, I, I would love to write that. I don't know about the legalities. I don't think DC would be very on board with that. Uh, but I would love to write a, a like a Bruce Wayne and Billionaire Island story. That would be fantastic. That's excellent reference for people who don't know to uh, Mark's great series at Ahoy Comics, Billionaire Island. That's great. Um, James wants to know too. Um, do you think that the Joker should be funny? Well, in my version. The Joker starts out very unfunny, like he's like a bad comedian. In fact, he doesn't even really see himself as a comedian at all. He sees himself as somebody who goes on stage because he just wants people to see him. He wants people to know that he exists. And he just says the saddest, most pathetic things possible about his life on stage. People think it's kind of, it's almost like Andy Kaufman or something, where people are kind of laughing at him more than with him. But the more evil and the more maniacal he becomes, the funnier he becomes. So he, it's sort of like his comedy becomes a performance art of like, you know, punishing society for not, for, for not caring about him. I like it. I, I mean, again, I think uh, I, the way you're presenting the story and the, uh, you know, again, the all reds are obviously firing on all cylinders as well. Um, how, how would you differentiate? Uh, and I mean, you know, it's it's in your story, but put in your in your own words uh, the differences that you see between Superman and Batman. Well, I think the big difference is that Superman sees um, things in galactic, universal terms. He sees justice as what is good for humanity, whereas to Batman, justice is what is good for Gotham. It's like he sees it very locally. He sees himself like a survivor in a shipwreck who's just trying to save the people around him. Whereas Superman sees himself as more like a guy building ships. <laughs> He's trying to prevent the shipwrecks from the first place. So I think that they're coming at the same problems from very two different directions. And I think it also sort of mirrors the different trajectories of their, their origin stories where Superman is like born into this great calamity and the, the destruction of Krypton. And, but from that destruction, he finds his very loving family and friends who, uh, you know, help, you know, make him a normal person and, and like teach him virtues and values. And he becomes this very well-adjusted superhero. Batman's story is almost the exact opposite where he starts from this very loving, nurturing family, lots of money, no problems in the world, all that's taken from him. And he's just sort of thrown into darkness and uh, loneliness. And he has to sort of fight his way back out of that. I like it. Absolutely, man. Um, and uh, listen, everybody, we don't have to just stick, and certainly I'm going to talk to, about uh, a new project Mark is in the midst of this as well. But if you want to do uh, Greatest Hits, I'm cool with that. In fact, uh, Michael asks, I'm sure you've told this story before. Ignore it if it's too repetitive. No, I want to hear this. How did you come up with that amazing Flintstones pitch? It was unlike anything I was expecting as a reader picking up. And let me echo that, Mark, because, and I know I've told you this before as well, initially – Seeing Steve, it was Steve Pugh, right? He was the artist. Yeah. Seeing the way Steve was drawing it, it was so off model and not your classic Hanna Barbera look. I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna like this. And also coming off, and again, everybody, this is me saying this. I hated the John Goodman movie. I didn't like the movie, the the subsequent sequel that wasn't John Goodman. I forget the British actor that played Fred. Could not stand those things. That said. What you did with the Flintstones was so fantastic. And when I actually sat down and read the book, it's like, oh, my God, this is great. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I that whole period when uh, DC got permission to do Hanna-Barbera stuff, and we could talk about Snagglepuss too, but first with um, the Flintstones, I, I know other uh, parodies of the Hanna-Barbera stuff, they weren't crazy about it. And I don't know what, uh, you know, again, did you need Hanna-Barbera's approval for the direction you wanted to take the Flintstones in? 
Uh, no, and thank God because they they did not approve. Uh, they were they were not happy with that first issue when it came out. I got like a like a laundry list of notes that were would have just destroyed the series if I if I'd listened. Uh, but luckily, you know, DC, you know, by which I mean Marie Javens and Dan DiDio were like, don't don't bother with it. Don't listen to them. Just continue making what you're going to make, and we'll deal with them. Uh, so I took that as a green light to write the series, but the way I wanted to, but sure. the way I had wanted to was very much, you know, based on the fact that there weren't, wasn't a lot about the Flintstones I actually liked, but the things I did like about them, I really wanted to le- lean into. And I always feel like that's sort of what you should do as a writer when you're working with another property, when you're working with somebody else's creation it's like you should only ever write from a place of love and write about the things you love about. And if you don't like the the title or the uh, the 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 property, you know, if you're not a fan, find something about it you do like and write about that. And for me, with the Flintstones, the things that I thought were really compelling and that I wanted to write about, and this sort of guided my entire approach to the series, were that this is set in the world's first civilization. So everything that I feel like is wrong with my civilization, I can sort of blame on bedrock <laughs> and you can write about how all the foundational problems with civilization were created by these people in bedrock. And in a way, not only does it give people who are reading it some distance, they don't feel defensive about like, well, he's attacking me and my country and my, the world that I live in. Cause I'm talking about this thing that happened, you know, tens of thousands of years ago but also you know in a lot of ways the people of bedrock have an excuse because they don't know any better they're making this up as they go along so you can't even really be mad at them you just sort of have to acknowledge like oh oh i know how this ends you guys are making a terrible mistake with this this bird god you know so that's the way i wanted to approach it and then the other thing i really sort of found fascinating about the flintstones even when i was a kid watching them on tv was the sort of animal appliances Yes. And and even when I was like, you know, nine or 10 years old, I remember just being kind of horrified by the fact that you have this pig you keep underneath the sink at all times or, or the worst, the worst one was the the bird and the camera where like they have a camera and then they take a picture and this bird comes out of the camera and chisels an image on like a little stone tablet. And then this is the part that sort of like creeped me out was it goes back into the camera and God knows how long it's in there. God knows how long it's inside the <laughs> camera until they have to take a picture again. And so I wanted to write about that, about how not only are the animals in the house used and viewed as appliances when they're actually like living, breathing people with lives and sort of aspirations and thoughts about the universe of their own, but then this is also how the people in the story are being used. Like Fred and Wilma are, are seen as like appliances to the people who pay them or the people who are, you know, uh, who are using, using them. And it's about how the limitations of our, of our sympathy, of our empathy are kind of to like those like ourselves, because Fred understands that Mr. Slate is treating him like an appliance and he feels very badly for himself and for his other fellow humans are being treated this way, but he doesn't extend that empathy to the animals that he's keeping in the closet or, you know, the bowling ball (laughs) that, that he, that he has. That's a, actually a living armadillo. And and so that was kind of my my metaphor for what we all do, where you know, we're all sensitive to our own pain, but but we'll heap abuse upon the barista because that's just the coffee serving appliance. Sure. They um you know, when uh recently uh when we heard oral arguments from the Supreme Court in that format that they do now, I I equated it to uh the bird ch- chiseling the photo i'm like you know uh and I, I i don't know why i i suppose they don't want us to see the poker faces of the justices but essentially it's like we're doing like radio like 1930s coverage of the supreme court here in the 21st century which kind of cracks me up and i'm like you know that's just one step above the uh the bird <laughs> the bird taking the photograph yeah. what, what better symbol do you need for an antiquated uh institution that is probably going to get us all killed (laughs) (laughs) as we laugh as the world is on fire absolutely man uh well michael agrees he's like uh, russell's flintstones had amazing allegories 
for real life issues. I've told you before, uh, the Flintst the bedrock version of the VFW, uh, the veterans of foreign wars and stuff. And they're talking about, you know, the attacks on their cave groups and stuff like that. Oh, I, I love that. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the yeah. things about the Flintstones I just could not relate to at all was the water buffaloes. Cause that's like very much a thing, you know, a product of the, the fifties and the sixties, these yeah. sort of like gentlemen's clubs, these sort yeah, of my dad, clubs. Was, my dad was a, my dad was an elk. For yeah, example, no, oh, Lions really Club, really. all these things. They were sure. around when I was a kid, but you know, they're they're not really relevant anymore. So I thought, well, what would make it relevant for now? And I thought, well, you know, all these people are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. It would be like a like a veteran support group. Hundred percent, man. I you know, my mom God bless my mom. She in the sixties had one of those beehive poofy <laughs> hairdos and stuff. And uh, I always tease her on Mother's Day and I show this great sixties picture of her. And I'm like, people don't know this, but my mom was actually a water buffalo. And then I take and I have the picture of her just with the beehive. And then next to it, I have a great group shot of the water buffaloes. I'm like, she's in the back row. You can't see her, but but she's there. She's back there. You need a but photo yeah, of in some like little horns coming out of her. <laughs> I should. I don't do that far. So, but yeah, it's great, man. It's uh, no. And also, I love. I bet you do too, Mark. I love the subtle pop culture t-shirts and i have one that is a water buffalo like union kind of t-shirt that it's water buffalo local 102 or whatever <laughs> and it's just got the helmet so you yeah, either got to yeah. be hip to the flintstones or you know i, I imagine now, maybe you're doing a, a like the pop culture sort of ironic tea that's the way to go it needs to be subtle enough that most people aren't going to get it and the few <laughs> the few people who do it will be a real treasure you know they will they will prize it so do you remember specifics? Because I would imagine your Snagglepuss was also probably not very warmly <laughs> received by Anna Barbera as well. They had kind of given up on me by then. They weren't really giving me much response. They just sort of like, well, that that's what's going to happen, I guess. But what was funny about Snagglepuss were some of the, uh, the uh, reviews, uh, especially early on, that it was getting from quote-unquote mainstream uh, places, most of which were positive, but but the right wing uh, media had some things to say about it. They had some opinions. Uh, I remember probably my favorite response was um, Blaze, uh, the the right wing online media uh, outlet, like ran an article accusing me of turning Snagglepuss gay, which you know it's just <laughs> sort of like turning Liberace gay, I guess. Um, <laughs> but. They posted to with the article. They posted a picture from like the first issue of like Snagglepuss kissing his boyfriend, and one of the commenters. This is maybe one of my favorite moments in my career. Uh, one of the poster, one of the commenters posted, uh, "That lion better be a woman," which I thought was just <laughs> hilarious because their problem was with the idea of be two men, not like that. There's like a human being kissing, a, you know, a mountain lion. <laughs> that's hilarious like, you know priorities jesus uh michael i agree exit stage right wing absolutely <laughs> man yes yeah, sadly no it was great and for people who didn't read it and should look for it basically you turn snagglepuss into tennessee williams uh, is that a fair yeah, that's very that's very accurate like you <laughs> tennessee williams was the model for snagglepuss uh it, and um and yeah, it was, it was very much the Southern Gothic playwright, you know, and a very sort of um, erudite and uh, well-read and this very respected literary figure. You're, you're in good company, man. I, I talked to Chaikin about his rough and ready and how, and how rough uh, it was as far as his treatment of those two. And yeah, just great satire, man. You guys, all of you, I mean, even the one shots, did you do one of those um, crossovers like King did with uh, Elmer Fudd and Batman? And, and yeah, uh, so I did one. Um, I did a Looney Tunes crossover between uh, uh, Porky Pig and Lex Luthor, <laughs> and I also did a Hanna Barbera crossover between uh, Green Lantern and Huckleberry Hound, which was in a lot of ways sort of a sequel to Snagglepuss because it was Huckleberry Hound's son who appears at the end of the Snagglepuss comic. And it was like ten, set 10 years later after the, the, the Snagglepuss comic, but it was supposed to be that same character, Huckleberry Hound Jr. 
meeting uh, John Stewart, then the Green Lantern. You know, it is it is so disappointing that Hanna Barbera. That really, I mean, thank God they were around in the fifties and sixties. And in fact, I dug up a nineteen eighty nine call in where Mel Blanc was on the radio here in Chicago from L.A. And I got to call in and I asked him about the tone of the Looney Tunes and the Hanna-Barbera cartoons because I'm like, you know, the writing was so great satirically. And and uh, and really, you know, for younger people, we're very lucky that since the 90s into the modern age that s satire came back to animation because this was 1989 when I was talking to Mel Blanc. And I'm like, it's such a shame how watered down the product has been with all the parent groups, you know, kind of clamping down and, well, there has to be a lesson and all that BS and stuff. And I think because Mel was still being employed by that 80s era of animation, he didn't want to crap on anybody as far as that era. But that's, it is a shame back to yeah, what, yeah. You, what you all did during that crossover period and Hanna-Barbera not seeing the joke. Yeah, well, you know, in the 40s and 50s, like when they did the Looney Tunes cartoons that were shown before movies in the theaters, they were meant for all ages. Like you had to be able to enjoy them on the level of a kid, but also as the level of an adult. So there was some of all of it. There was some slapstick. There was some like social commentary. There was some like uh, sort of edgy one-liners and stuff in, in that that were like kind of borderline for what was socially acceptable. And yeah. uh, that's what made it work. Uh and then when Saturday morning TV came along in the 60s and 70s, all these sorts of properties got repurposed for children, where it's, okay, we're just making it for children, and yeah, there's got to be an educational component, there's got to be, you know, least objectionable material where, you know, it's like, we cannot get any angry phone calls from any parents whatsoever, and it kind of became sanitized. And, but luckily, you know, the kids who are watching those, including myself, grew up and so when we grew up, we had expectations that these cartoons would grow up with us. And so we brought back in the satire and the sort of social commentary and the, the edgier elements uh, of, of what we like now into the things that we enjoyed back then. Agreed. Well, and like James just said, Tom and Jerry are friends now. Those, yeah, oh my right. God, I think they're from the 70s. And you compare those old MGM Tom and Jerry's to... The the more mo and again well modern those, are like, those were like the animated version of like 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 John Wick movies. They they were, those old Tom and Jerry cartoons are so absolutely some of the most violent things I've ever seen, and just like not just violent but mean spirited. Like they they genuinely were torturing each other. Uh, so yeah, it, <laughs> it, you know I got to hand it to um, God. I want to I, I shame on me. I now I'm blanking. But they did a they did a Tom and Jerry meet Johnny Quest animated movie in the last few years. I can't even and, imagine what that would be like. You know, honestly, to their credit, they managed to capture a bit of the old MGM spirit because they were kind of fighting each other, and then they run into the Quest family, and they're just along for the ride. And you know, but bandits constantly barking at them and stuff. But yeah, it was. I I give I give uh, the modern people credit for. Again, I and I and I think that well, again, I don't know how they got it past Anna Barbera or whatever, but um, yeah, it, it at least it was a little bit better. Here's some uh, here's some questions from uh, from the audience. James wants to know: Are there any modern entertainers that you think are as interesting as these classic era uh, Hollywood figures? Modern entertainers, like live action people. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. I think that. Um... That yeah, there, there's not a lot of physical comedy going on right now. Most almost all of it's like uh, one-liners or you know, sort of cerebral, sort of counterculture comics. So I don't know. I guess the answer to that's no. At least not interesting in the same way. Sure, sure. Have you have you ever thought and then have you tried to get on get on the animation side? Because again, I think you got a great satirical sense of humor. I would love to. Uh, I I did. Um, I have written a pilot for a series based upon Second Coming, one of the, the creator-owned titles I've done with Ahoy. And it got very far in the approval process at Paramount Plus, like to the point where we were in like sort of the final meeting with the vice president of, uh, of production to, to yay or nay it. And uh, unfortunately, at that point, it occurred to them they probably didn't want to build their new 
animation brand around a cartoon about Jesus Christ. So they made it. <laughs> but I would love to see it get made somewhere. And I think it's Bad, yeah. it would be a good series. And I'm I'm really proud of the uh, the pilot that I wrote for it. So hopefully it gets picked up somewhere. Well, again, another another great uh, Mark uh, book. If you if everyone hasn't uh, checked out Second Coming, I'm so happy for you and Chip Zdarsky from where you guys came from when you were doing your independent stuff to the fact now that the big two trust you guys enough with the big toys, and you're able to get you know, and also again, I mean, there's I so and really I don't know because what's coming in Dark Age, there might be a moment of humor here and there, but when you do straight up action superhero stuff both of you guys are great yeah the one thing people don't seem to respect or realize is that it's actually harder to write comedy it's actually harder to write something funny than it is to write something straight and serious so in a lot of ways it's like yeah this is i can do this i think and i think also stories like even serious stories kind of follow the same pattern as joke telling where you have like an unusual premise there's a turn and then a revelation and I think the pattern of joke telling, even if you're not trying to be funny, usually makes for really compelling stories. Uh, Michael has a question regarding Dark Age and Space Age. Could you see doing the Space Age and now the Dark Age with any other artists other than Mike Allred? It's he seems like a per perfect fit for this series. Yeah, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be part of this series without Mike Allred. Uh, it's just he's too much of the, a, a part of the soul of the series. I can see myself doing a Superman or a Batman comic with another artist, but it wouldn't be the same. I, it, like if, if we got approved to do a third one, and another artist came on, it would just, we just have to call it something else. We wouldn't be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even like try to pretend that this was the same thing because his, his DNA is so embedded in these, these comics. Michael has a follow-up. Uh, how much do you write for uh, the panels per pages and how much do you leave Mike alone to break down the pages himself? Well, that's a good question. And uh, I, I write full scripts. So I break down the pages into individual panels, but it's always, always with the understanding that Mike, you can ignore this. You can do it. Just draw what you think is best. This is just the movie as it's playing in my mind, but, but Mike is also ultimately the director. And so a lot of times he'll just like take like all the, the panels I've written on a page except for one and toss them onto the next page and just create a splash page where he wants to, or this is what he wants to draw. Or sometimes he'll just say, well, screw it. I'm just going to turn this into one image and make it a two page spread. And I love it when he does that because one, it's always better than what I came up with where it's like 10 panels of people talking to each other or, you know, like little bits of action fighting. And he just does this Diego Rivera esque sort of mural of like everybody on the page together sort of in combat and it's just like wow this is so much better so i i invite him to sort of throw out the script as it were and i i think the agreement we have is that my words the dialogue and the captions will all appear in the comic they might not appear in the artwork that i intended them to appear in and that's fair that's probably the best way for both of us to work together he doesn't interfere with the words and i don't really interfere with his art well, and again, I would imagine this cover, this alternate cover, uh, was his inspiration, and it's totally just like, yeah. yeah. I have no yeah. input in that. That's all, Mike. <laughs> you know, based on the era, and again, your story is more realistic. But I, I, and in fact, I wondered, based on this um, image, if perhaps uh, a fifties character that was a big part of the Dick Sprang era of Batman. Uh, was it uh, Professor Nichols that used to send them back in time all the time? I think and you're right. Had, yeah, you know, and I didn't know if he. I don't know if he's gonna show up. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, no, again, we got we got one sort of quasi time traveler, and it's you know, the, I want to give away, but yeah, it's not. Yeah, him. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Please don't. Absolutely, man. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is all right? Ryan Cheshire says, uh, "I love your work, Mark." Uh, Good is disappointed in you. God, I think it means God is disappointed in you, which is ah, all right. Yeah, that, right. I ever, I ever ah. told it. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very proud of that. And it's, it's, it's the reason it's the I have reason a career. career. Mike remembers uh, Professor uh, Nichols. Yeah, time travel through hypnosis. Absolutely, man. Yeah, did you? Uh, and again, it's more of a visual thing. But you, did you look at all at, at those Dick Spring 
era, you know, 50s Batman stories? Not specifically. I didn't look at them as research, but I've, I've seen them before. Sure. I have, you know, in the 90s, he made this amazing uh, lithograph of like all, all the villains and stuff. And it just that 50s classic Batman and Robin look. I like two in the animated uh, series. They had one episode where a bunch of kids were telling different versions of Batman around a campfire. And one of the stories they told was clearly Dick Sprang um, inspired. And in fact, I want to say Michael McKeon played the Joker in that segment and everything. But yeah, and I mean, the animation looked just like a Dick Sprang book. So, um, all right. And now Michael says, thanks. I always wondered how it works when you have a great artist to work with. Absolutely. Yeah, no, my, my advice is when you have an artist, the caliber of Mike Allred, just get out of their way. Absolutely. Um, Mike also, Michael also says, Mike will take any crowd scene, Mark wrote, and pair it down to two people in the audience. So lazy. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think Mike loves doing, uh, like you said, I think like, Mike loves doing a big crowd scene and, and different. He does, but he, he's, he's, he's like a boxer, you know. He, he sort of like plans his punches. So, yeah, a lot of the panels will focus on like one person or two people or a specific scene within a crowd. And then you'll turn the page and it'll be a double a page spread showing the whole crowd, which I think is better. You know, it, it's better to have these sorts of variations where you see a wide shot and then a narrow shot and then, you know, a medium shot than to just have sort of the same panel over and over again. He's very good at mixing it up. Yeah. Well, again, this is why he's one of the masters, man. And I'm so glad that uh, the two of you are working together. It's no, oh, they're, they're, no it's and I, I, I hope to hell you get that third, uh, chapter with with wonder woman mike wants to know who's what is the most underappreciated publisher in comics today my vote is humanoids well i think it's a i honestly think it's a several way tie and i would put a hoy in that in that grouping as well frankly i would definitely put a hoy in that grouping i think another publisher that deserves mention is a blaze because they're 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 a very small publisher but they're they're you know between uh if I might be so bold, uh, traveling to Mars, my comic I'm writing for them in Animal Kingdom, they they're a very small company that's that's publishing like uh, I think I think award worthy work. You know, they're they're taking some big chances and I think it's paying off. Tell me about this book, Mark, because uh, we really haven't had a chance to talk about it before. Well, traveling to Mars is uh, my story about the first man mission to Mars. And the person they, they choose to go to Mars, Roy Livingston, is chosen because he's terminally ill. So they only have to send him to Mars. They don't have to bring him back. And one so way. Once go, they have one way ticket to Mars. And once he goes there, he's supposed to claim the mineral wealth of the planet for this company that makes sort of artificial meat uh, that, 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 that paid that bought the the spacecraft that's sending him and it's really a very personal story though it's about him talking about his regrets now that he's left earth and he knows he's going to mars to die he's talking about all the things he did wrong on earth and all the regrets he has and all the people he's leaving behind and also what he's worried about what's going to happen to the human race because it's in a bad state back on earth and um it's one of the most personal and it borrows a like on some like uh, semi-autobiographical things from my life and uh, I'm just extremely proud of it. I think it's one of the best things I've ever written and, it, and it's very much about how he gains this sort of cosmic perspective on his life now that it's at its end and I you know uh, I really hope it's kind of the book the collected book is coming out in May and I really hope people will give it a shot because um, I feel like this is one of the few things I want to be known for uh, you know, you got to come back and further uh, through email. Please give me, um, like, if if there's an editor in chief at Blaze or whatever, because yeah, you know, I want to I want to bring focus to some of these other uh, comic publishers and stuff. Uh, yeah, Rich now, Young is the uh, CEO. I think he's also the editor in chief there. It's a, you know, I think I think he's pretty much the only employee there, but wow. he's doing like amazing work uh, for for being such a small operation. Well, you know, in May, when when the when the collection comes out, come back and we could talk about uh, we the Mars story in full. We'll and, be happy uh, to, and, and DC Patrol will be able to. We'll know by then uh, how how it all works out. And yeah, he uh, uh, for the audio audience, he's asking how much should I prepare to cry next week with traveling to Mars. You know, there is that issue of traveling to Mars drops next week, and I have to say, like, I, I can't remember a time where you know I, I put the finishing touches on an issue. And I just felt more at peace with 
with how this ends and this being so close to what I would have in my wildest dreams could have imagined it, you know, how it, how it ended. That's great. You know, I, I've really appreciated uh, more recent science fiction that really looks at the astronaut and how, I mean, of course we had the Martian, but also, and I'm forgetting the name of this one book, uh, Rob Burnett, uh, I always raved about it on his uh, YouTube show about, you know, just that unique position of, of an astronaut who will achieve something like walking on the moon or going to Mars or whatever, and how that's such an individual thing that really 99.9% .9 of the world can't relate to because there's so few people that have experienced that. Yeah. And what is your, and it's interesting that you've got a terminal guy going to Mars because also it's like, I know in this novel, it's like years after this man walked on the moon, this fictional character. And it's like, what do you do when your greatest accomplishment was 30 years in your past? What's your life like after that? Yeah. You know? Well, in, in Roy's uh, case, it's like not even really his accomplishment. I mean, yeah, he's going to be the one walking on Mars, but he had absolutely nothing to do with it. He was until, you know, just before he left to Mars, like, like an assistant manager at a pet store. And he went from being like a terminally ill assistant manager for a pet store to being kind of the most famous man on earth, like, like a month later. And yeah. it was just sort of about, you know, the, the, the luck of fate or the, the bad luck of fate. Sure. About how we yeah. are just sort of like a, a pinball in a machine that we don't really have access to the flippers for. Uh, comment from Mike. Sadly, some of these small publishers, I don't notice. There's a lot to dig through in the solicits. I'm glad to hear about this book and how passionate you are about it. Absolutely, man. You know, although I got to say, and it's something that I've been paying attention to when I, you know, this, I, my 19th anniversary is coming up May 10th. And I think about these 19 years of how I've been watching comics and truly companies like Blaze, Ahoy, Black Mask, human, even Humanoids that has a bigger profile and had a bigger profile than some of these other companies. I really think uh, the output has been great and they've been smart in telling different stories than what the big two will give us. And I yeah. mean, I, you know, again, it's all in the execution and there's always room for more traditional superhero stories or whatever genre you want to take. But I really do think that these publishers are looking for the atypical book. And, and I'm glad that, you know, people like you are out there thinking along these lines. Well, thank you. Yeah, as they should be, because there's no point in, you know, doing a formula that's already being done by somebody bigger and more successful than you are. You I know, completely agree. Yeah. You, you do something new. You do something that's sort of on the edges of what, you know, it's like the classic art of war. It's like if you are have a small army, you don't want to go into a full frontal assault against a big army. You want to use guerrilla warfare tactics. You want to travel quickly into places where they cannot go and the same is true with publishing it's like you have a smaller operation you're never going to you know create the next captain america or batman so there's no point in trying to compete with the big two on that you need to be telling the stories they are too big and too afraid to tell it, oh yes as you say too afraid to tell i remember when you had mentioned captain america i remember when mark fair Hayden back in the and now i gotta think about it for a minute i think it was in the 90s when he created the american and it was essentially a super soldier character, but obviously being able to do with it his way and, and really telling a very different Captain America story that Marvel would never approve of, you know, these days or even, you know, back in the 90s and stuff. So, yeah, I think I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, are you still uh, are you writing novels still as well or are you pretty much sticking to comics these days? Well, I have written a prose book. It hasn't been uh, announced or uh, it won't come out to 2025, but I'll tease it here. Uh, it's a retelling of the uh, Brothers Grimm fairy tales, uh, but through my lens with modern language and stuff. And it's not all of them, obviously, because there's like hundreds of Brothers Grimm fairy tales. But I chose 12 and I'm retelling and writing this book. And uh, it's going to be called Grimm and Grimmer. Outstanding. Well, good luck with that. That's cool. Uh, James, is this directed to me? I listened to your interview with Neil Adams while working a room uh, of computers back before the company blocked MP3s. I'm a, I don't know if, if you've ever if you ever had conversations with Neil, but I did certainly a couple times. Ah, he says yes. All right, he's talking to me. 
Well, that's nice, man. I'm glad you. I'm glad you heard it. I've been very lucky, man, and truly, and not to, you know, like I'm. I, I'm very grateful for this. I don't want to. I don't want to. This is like you know, puffing myself up. But again, man, no, uh, Neil Adams, uh, Denny O'Neill, um, Gene Colan, to name a few. My good friend Marty Pasco, who it makes me sad this time of year every year because I think about Marty and I can't believe he's not with us anymore. Uh, I've been very fortunate to talk to a lot of. Uh, good people from comics history and stuff and get them sadly, you know, before they pass and have decent conversations. So, you know, but back to the living, back to what uh, Mark's doing. You got, uh, what, what uh, conventions have you got coming up, Mark? Uh, I've got San Diego and New York. And those are the only two conventions I'm doing this year. Although I'm, I'm hoping to do some more traveling. I'm going to Fort Wayne, Indiana for a signing there in May. And I'm also doing a stint teaching comics in Dublin, Ireland, which I'm excited about later in june and uh yeah and i'm hoping to go to the uh uh, the ala conference in uh, san diego in late june early july that's great um and the reason why i went oh when you mentioned dublin i'm gonna be there in august for uh, a comic show yeah so we're just gonna miss each other by a couple months yeah no i think uh uh like uh bendis and some of the other uh creators i know are, are are going to the uh, the Dublin Comic Con in August, and they're yeah, I, I, I've, I know there's some other people are going. I wish I could be there. Uh, DC Patrol excited for Grim and Grimmer, so that's Great. cool. And uh, Mike says earlier, it sounds like you have a third age book. If all yes, and uh, yes, indeed, as we said, it would be Wonder Woman. Yeah, yes, it will be Wonder Woman. So that's cool. Um, James, can we get Mark's wish list for any mm. characters going into the public domain? That's interesting. You know, I got a theory about that, but go ahead, Mark, if you have any thoughts. Well, on that. the one that I, you know, I, I've always kind of used to answer this question, but I feel like it's been sort of ruined because Jason Aaron is doing it now is Scrooge McDuck. That's always a character I've always thought would be amazing to write. But now that Jason Aaron's doing a series, it's probably going to ruin it for the rest of us. Cause I'm sure his series will be <laughs> fantastic. So um, other than that, I'm probably, I think, I think it would be good to do, um, like uh like maybe like uh the spirit oh that'd be amazing sure wow and i wonder that so that was 1940 so and yeah, I probably wonder, right about, we're getting close yeah yeah um uh, that's interesting you know i was telling uh dan jurgens and mike perkins with their uh their batman story that they're doing that essentially is in that detective 27 era and um I, I know they pitched it, and may, again, I don't know what was on the minds of the lawyers, but I almost wonder, because it's set in that Detective 27 era, should someone try to do a public domain Bruce Wayne Batman story with the, uh, you know, where Batman was in that first issue of Detective 27 and stuff, yeah. that they could point to this current black label book and go well you know uh we just did this story so that's gonna be i i wonder if that's you know kind of a copyright kind of uh snag that as much as people are excited about doing public domain superman or batman they they might want to think twice i don't know yeah, yeah. no I, I think it would be great if they if someone did a uh batman story but it was like the original uh bob kane design where he's got the red tights and the sort of bat wings oh even out. more so yes my that god would be, you're right. that would be great i would love to see that i wonder if anyone you know and obviously they never really published that per se so i wonder if that yeah i wonder if that version you could do which would be crazy I yeah mean, that one might be that one might actually be coming up in the public domain and that would be fantastic do sort uh, of off-putting batman story <laughs> this guy well in this in this story that that jurgens and perkins are doing um you know, they're like, well, you know, there's no Alfred. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, certainly no Robin. It really yeah, is the, Bruce. The original Bob King that didn't have any Joker or, you know, uh, Commissioner Gordon or any of these characters. It was just this, you know, guy in a wrestling outfit, like, at night. To, to, the, to the point where there also wasn't a Batmobile yet, and there was a red roadster that, that Bruce uh, or Batman drove around in. And it was so great. Uh, um, Perkins just holds up this red model and stuff, and he goes, "Yeah, this is what I'm using as a model." I'm like, "Oh my god, that's outstanding!" I used to have those Mike Fleischer encyclopedias of Batman and Superman. I right. didn't get the Wonder Woman one, but I did get those two. And oh yeah, it was you know, God, just the minutia 
of that of that history and when things first really debuted it's it's amazing mike uh, yes mike you're absolutely right um of course john oliver has been having great fun with uh steam steamboat willie on his show and i know much like the windy the pooh horror movie that there is a steamboat willie horror film in the works and stuff oh wow so, yeah crazy yeah steamboat willie weirdly was actually predates even that cartoon it was like sort of a a folk hero like there was like all these folk songs about uh, you know a character named Steamboat Willie. The cartoon was actually based upon this already existing public domain character. <laughs> I understand. Someone's asking again uh, for the name of your uh, your Mars book through Blaze. Oh, traveling to Mars. Traveling to Mars, and again the trade is coming out in May, so yeah, that's cool. Um, if yeah, you, uh, you know the uh, the final work cut off for your uh, your local comic shop is April eighth. So just let your com local comic store you want know you want a copy of Traveling to Mars. So is it the, are those the two books right now, uh, Mark? As far as ones that you can talk about, yeah, and and ones that I, I know are on the way. Uh, yeah, eventually, uh, I am doing a, a series with Dark Horse, which hasn't been announced yet, so I I, I won't talk about. It, but I'm also really looking forward to that. Cool. When can you at least give us a ballpark? Summer, fall. I can tell you what it. Uh, I think they're gonna. They're saying fall of two thousand twenty-four, uh, and it's about a silent film comedian along the lines of Buster Keaton and his life. Wow. Story. Yeah. Oh, that's dude. That's awesome. Well, again, you know, I'm a sucker for twentieth century pop culture. So yeah, no, I, you I, got I, my full attention. And, that's and um, the artist who I worked with on Snagopus, Mike Fian, is doing the art. Oh, that's excellent. Hey, that's great, man. So I always, with a uh, bit of pride of the family, uh, on my grandmother's side of the family, when she came to, uh, from Greece, her brothers were here first in Chicago, and they were silent film projectionists during that Nickelodeon era of the early 1900s. Nice. And that's how they raised the money to, to bring their sister over and stuff. That's so great. Yeah. I, and I, I do like to tell my friends that are TV and movie people, it's like, well, this is my, uh, my family's involvement in the in the theater in the movie theater business and stuff so yeah pretty cool crazy man well this is great mark honestly i'm very excited for you and i and uh, i love the start of uh, dark age i think it's terrific um oh here we go uh yeah uh, dc patrol excited for the dark horse project so that sounds great oh thank you yeah no I'm, I'm really looking forward to it it's what the, the most fun i had writing it was coming up with my own sort of like scenes from silent movies my own sort of silent film comedy scenes but yeah, I had a great time writing it. On YouTube, there's a great TV syndicated TV series from the 80s that I want to say James Mason was the narrator for. And it's just called Hollywood. And it really goes through the silent era. And I mean, it was like at least eight or 10 episodes long. I think I've seen that. Yeah, it was written. Uh, gosh, I forgot the name of the guy who wrote it. But yeah, I think it was called... Uh, yeah, Hollywood, and then like the the, the byline was like, uh, like old legends or something like that. But yeah, it was it's an amazing documentary. If it's the same one I'm thinking of, it was an amazing documentary. And each sort of episode had a different focus on silent Hollywood. Like one was about the comedians, and one was about the uh, scandals, and one was about the uh, the the action heroes and stuff. Exactly, and and thankfully there were a handful of uh, veterans from the era. Yeah, that was that what was, was amazing. Around. Like the documentary, they're talking to like you know Lillian Gish, and uh, you know, um, other, I think they spoke to Douglas Fairbanks, and some of them. Uh, yeah, it's just crazy that that you know they they were making this documentary early enough that the, that the these people from the 1910s, who were the major film stars, the 1910s and 20s, were still around. Uh, James says a final question wants to know if you uh, ever would have a crack or interest. In doing the Boahaha Justice League era, the Dematas, Dematas, rather. Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I love, you know, one of my favorite things in DC of all time is Justice League International. I think it's one of the best things DC has ever done. I would, and I, and I almost want to, don't want to do it because I don't want to ruin it. But, um, but if, but if they offered me the chance to write a, a JLI title, I would certainly take them up on it. Well, what was the name of that uh, super team? book that you had a, a couple years ago from oh, uh, one, uh, one star squadron one star squadron absolutely like, like the b, b level heroes yeah 
They're actually more like C or D level heroes, but absolutely. Are there still any other um, C or D level DC heroes you'd love to like throw in a book? Yeah, well, what I wanted to do and what I probably would have done if that had been more successful would would have been to do like a follow up series about the villains, about the sort of like D list villains, uh, you know, uh, and and show their side of the equation. But you know, One Star Squadron sort of sink like a stone i read it i loved it well, thank and I, you it, it cracked me up absolutely man you know what's crazy? I, I believe in that series as much as i believe in any of the ones i've written it's just that sometimes they they you know they click with the public imagination and sometimes they don't and all you can really do is just keep keep moving keep making more i uh, i agree with dc patrol one star squadron criminally missed and yeah i don't know i i i don't know who we talked to at dc about taking a chance and making a trade of it if it wasn't made into a trade well there um, is a trade there is a trade of it oh, okay. it, it sells uh, just as badly as the original comic series so um, <laughs> well maybe that means there's a bunch of copies out there that people yeah, can no, grab I'm sure it's not a hard pickup it. you probably find one at the dollar tree <laughs> i've never seen comics at the dollar tree but you, that's a great you idea. now <laughs> you get outstanding like, you get a, a free, buy a can of chili, you get a free one. <laughs> Dollar Tree Chili. That's a title for an Ahoy book, I think. I don't know, man. Jesus. Um, you know, I I, I I mentioned this to Allred, and he didn't know the character. Do you know this DC space character from the 60s, Ultra the Multi-Alien? Never it's fine if you know. They're, literally, I don't even think they made 10 issues of his series. He took over... I want to say strange adventures from Adam strange for a minute. And um, it, to me the literally because he's like different body parts represent different alien races. And I'm like, Oh, this is so all red. You gotta, you yeah, got, you, like you know? Yeah. If you look him up, you'll see what I'm saying. It's like, Oh my God, absolutely. And it's shocked me because Mike's even a little older than me. And I'm like, Oh, you know, I, I you know, I remember probably reading, reprints of of some of his 10 page stories in those 100 page spectaculars they used to put out in the 70s and stuff but yeah anyway all right i, I took a chance because again you seem to you seem to know your stuff uh oh that's Not hilarious really. james, says, james says thanks to who's who in the dc universe i know who you're talking about yeah man <laughs> Ridic and a, and a ridiculously bad uh uh, origin story too, but again, it was the '60s. What are you going to do? They yeah. were writing for ten-year-olds back then. You know how it is. Yeah, and they're so. all on shrooms. So, what do you expect? <laughs> Great talking to you, as always, Mark. Truly, I, I thank you for coming back. And uh, as all, you know, please let me know. And happy to have you back on when the Blaze Book uh, is, uh, you know, out there and everything. And we, you know, we could talk about that, uh, you know, in May or whatever. Yeah. Whatever, whatever would work best. I mean, even if it is better to talk sooner than later for the cutoff or whatever to order it, I'm happy I to have you. Yeah, once, when the book starts to come out, we'll, we'll, we'll talk then. Uh, so I've just already given people the FOC. But yeah, that'd be great. Thanks a lot, John. Oh, my pleasure, man. Uh, just to, so everybody knows, uh, coming up uh, still this week on Word Balloon, I got two more interviews happening tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, during the afternoon, I'm going to be talking across the pond to Paul Cornell who, uh, with his co-writer, they've written a new uh, Loch Ness Monster murder mystery, Who Killed Nessie? And that's going to be a, a fun book to talk about tomorrow afternoon uh, with Paul Cornell. But then also uh, tomorrow night, I'll be talking to Alex Segura about his Dick Tracy book that he's writing with Mike Morisi for Mad Cave. And again, Chicago guy. So I'm, uh, Those are both good writers, by the way. I like both their work. Totally, man. No, I'm... I'm so happy for both guys. I mean, you know, obviously Alex is killing it in the mystery novel world as well as his comics. And Maurice, beyond his comics, is killing it in movies. You know, so yeah, look, I, uh, I'm going to have a separate conversation with Maurice in the weeks ahead as well. But it's Segura tomorrow night, Paul Cornell tomorrow afternoon. So I hope people will join us. Until uh, next time, everybody stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. Mm -hmm.